Hey guys, it's Clarence from Asian Tech Guy here again. So my previous build, I was on the NR200 white. That's an ITX case, which I absolutely love. However, it crept the shit out of me. I started getting BSODs for no reason. And my secondary drive is not getting detected. It's M.2 NVMe. It's only 500GB, but it's what I use as my scratch drive for video editing. So it's kind of a bummer. I contacted Gigabyte USA, but I didn't get a favorable response from them. Luckily, thanks to Amazon's excellent customer service, I was able to return my Gigabyte Aorus B550 Pro AX motherboard even after a year, so kudos to Amazon for that. I also took this as a bit of an excuse to build something different. This time, I'm going to move away from the small form factor kind of form factor if you know what I'm talking about. This is a pain in the butt to work with and rather than space to rock cables and get a lot of fingers cut during my previous build from my own rig. So this time I'm going to move to something bigger. I'm going to move to a mid tower. The CPU I was using was the Ryzen 7 5800X and it fits my needs just fine. I'm editing footage in 1080p and gaming in ultra 3440 by 1440p uh, which is absolutely enough. So I don't feel the need to you know, go higher, obviously towards Intel 12th gen. But given a choice, I would choose the 12th 700K right now as it's kind of like an 8-core equivalent of the 5800X. And there's probably no need to go for the 12th 900KS, which is way overkill, especially for what I'm doing. For me, staying on the 5800X is that I will save some money and it also gives me the option to wait and see for the next generation of AMD and possibly 13th gen Intel. You can work for that and decide again what to do. So what did I end up buying? I got here the MSI Mac X570 Unified Motherboard. It's a very slick all black design. No RGB, that's just my thing. This guy has very beefy VRMs, so has onboard reset power buttons, and even that uh, debug LED. So it's really helpful if you're trying to troubleshoot stuff. Very nice iOS, very beefy design all around with just enough I believe this guy has three M.2 slots with at least two being PCIe Gen 4. The third one, I'm not too sure, but I'm just going to be using two in this build. This guy is also pretty hefty. The weight of this is tremendous, which signifies quality, I suppose. <laughs> it's a steel my books. I got this at a very nice price. As I go through the parts, I'll show the prices on screen. And now you also find links to these parts I used in this video. Description box down below. For the storage solution, I've got it from Gen 3 NVMe SSDs to these guys, the RF Gen 4 NVMe SSDs. These are two times one terabyte drives, which is plenty nice for my needs. Uh, on the box, it says up to 5000 megabytes per second read and 4400 megabytes per second write. So that's pretty insane. We're gonna test these guys out. This don't come with any uh, heat sinks, but that's fine because the motherboard has it. So I'm in for a treat. It'd be very weird to hold on to a SFX power supply if I were to build in a mid-tower chassis. So I swap out that Corsair SF750 for this guy. It's pretty hefty and fully modular. This guy is the Cooler Master... I forgot the name. <laughs> this guy is the Cooler Master V850 Gold V2 power supply. Fully modular. Well, I got this used, but he has all those cables, but I have the whole bag of cables as well, which I don't have it with me right now. And this guy has plenty of warranty left in it, so I'm not worried whatsoever. Right, next up, I got here a Cooler Master Vertical GPU kit. It comes with PCIe 3.0 riser. So I believe you guys know what's up when I get this guy. And why PCIe 3.0 and not 4.0? I was also a bit hesitant at first, but going through some other creators on YouTube. They have actually tested PCI 3.0 on the latest and greatest GPUs and they haven't even fully saturated the 3.0 leads. So I should be plenty fine with this guy. I wouldn't expect much if any performance loss. For fan and cable extensions, you see where I'm going this time. It's all black and grey and so is this PC build. These are Techwear Flex cable extensions. I've got them used and new mixed for fans. I've got an all Noctua. These are the Noctua Redux line. Uh, they're basically a scaled down version. 
of the original Noctos that are a tad less expensive but don't include any anti vibration pads or whatsoever. So I got this black pads and also some black anti vibration mounts to play into the black and grey team. Hopefully, this works just fine. I'm going to be using 240mm for intake and 120mm for exhaust. So it's going to be a negative pressure. Uh, just keep dust away from the system real fine and pray these guys work out for me. For the main event, the GPU, this is something I already have. It's a really fat boy. Uh, this is the Pilot RTX 3080 Gaming Pro. The fan stroke design has black and grey or rather black and silver essence. And when I vertically mount this guy, it will look pretty awesome in this black and grey team build I have going. And seriously guys, I'm really pumped for this. Last but not least, everything is going to be built in this guy. The fractal design much spicy. This is a tried and tested chassis. Reason why I got this aged chassis. Pretty good afro because of this front perforated design. I got this used for just 65 bucks. And this is of pristine condition, which is really a steel. Tried and tested. So I don't mind not having the latest and greatest as long as it works fine and you know, it's pleasant to the eye. With everything introduced, let's get everything out of the way and get the fucking building. <sighs> so we're taking that case right apart, right out of the gate. The mesh file C doesn't support vertical GPU brackets. We're gonna cut off those horizontal slots or the PCIe slot covers. But before that, we're gonna do a test fit to make sure everything fits, especially with my fat boy of a GPU. Now for the moment of truth, if it's such a bummer, if the GPU didn't fit, <laughs> it means I just got a like, horizontal mount this, or maybe find a different chassis, we'll see. We'll find out just in a little bit. Boom. Yeah, awesome, it'll fit. Just probably left one cm of space there. Yeah, that works. So now what we got to do is just snip off these guys. Well, I don't have any professional tools. Hopefully this cheap $2 guy work. Hopefully that do a trick. Otherwise I probably have bought the electric drill. I have some kind of saw blade attachment and that will probably work given some time. Well, whatever. Let's just not overthink it and just wing it. Well, this guy's these guys are thick. I'm gonna try cutting this one off first. I have a bad feeling about this, but let's just go ahead. <sighs> Damn it. Let's just go to the very edge, back down on it. Boom. Hey. Oh no, I didn't fully cut through. Let's try again. Yeah, we are true, and probably got to foul that. Yeah, as long as we get through, the rest we can always foul down. It doesn't look too pretty, but it's behind the chassis, so it don't, don't matter so much. Yeah, we are true. So now just got to repeat for the rest. So we took off those PCI slot covers, and we're gonna just rinse and repeat. It's a tech wear case. This will cut you like butter for sure. <laughs> Fractal, you have done well. Got my $2 pies. Still getting the best of you. Yeah. And with that, it's all done. It's all like fucking sharp. I'll try, probably try to file it down just a little bit for safety reasons. As I said, this is behind the tower. So I'm not bothered too much of how it's looking but more of that safety aspect. Now for some filing action. Here we go. So that's it. That's a very rough job. So I'm going to repeat it the other side. 
it's too boring. I'll skip to when I'm done with this. So that's the end result. Still a little rough. It's in tool shop where it will cause a huge safety hazard. With that out of the way, it's time to get building. So I'll first be prepping the motherboard for installation. I'm going to be using an aftermarket cooler, so I'm definitely going to remove these two guys. And we're going to install the CPU cooler after we install the motherboard onto the chassis because of these guys. Yeah. The arrangements of this and with that beefy, I mean, I'm using the Fuma tool. It's not too beefy, but it'll still be hard to access. You're going to get a lot of, a lot of cuts if you try to install the cables after you have the CPU installed. So I'm going to install it later on. With that being said, let's go ahead. I'm going to first be removing this, the CPU cooler retention brackets. Uh, uh, we don't need this. We have to install that Fumato mounting base. Time to install the Fumato mounting brackets. Forgot how to do this. <laughs> so I'm looking at the manual through my phone because I'm a dumbass. Install these spacers. Spacers, I mean. Yeah, just like that. Boom. Boom. And then I'm supposed to screw on those brackets right here, right? Just like that. Next, we peel off whatever peel that we can see on the motherboard. I'm gonna move my Mac close for this one. This thing reads play hard, stay silent. So it's some kind of VRM cooler or rather motherboard cooler. I don't know what it calls. <laughs> I'm an idiot like that. Basically, it has that zero frost technology. If it's not at a high load and you're not producing too much heat, it will stay silent, it will not turn on. Let's get closer to get a peel. Alright, next up, we'll install M.2 drives. They'll be them pesky to install after you have all your components. So I always make sure to install them first. They have this nice black, uh, you know, anodized heat sinks. They feel really well. I'm going to be using the topmost and a middle slot. Damn sure to make sure I pre off these guys. Otherwise, the heat can't dissipate properly. Them, these M.2s are really screwed down tight. Even the mounting base themselves. I mean the M.2 standoffs. Yeah, they come off together when I unscrew them for both M.2 heat sinks. Alright. M.2 installation, here we go. I'm gonna make sure I don't screw those down too tight. When I first installed my very first M.2 drive, I actually screwed down real tight and even stripped the entire standoff. Just bummer. I had to like have a heat sink and just Screw it down and make sure it holds somehow. You don't want to over tighten in this case. If you're using any electric screwdriver, like this guy, you have a speed setting. So make sure you use the lowest speed possible. I'm going to be using speed one so that I don't over tighten it. I need to get my M.2 screws. They're still in the motherboard case. God damn it. This motherboard comes with a very nice case that stores all of, all of the screws, cables and accessories that you need. Time to screw these guys down. Here we go. Let's hold it down. Alright. When there's resistance, just stop. Going not enough is better than going too far. Boom. Now to motherboard installation, easy peasy. 
since I don't have to install the I.O. shoe, just gotta drop this thing here. Hey. To go. Align all the holes. The motherboard standoff. And yeah, I realized that one of the motherboard standoffs is blocked by this heat shoe. So I gotta remove that. Damn it, I hate this double job shit. Yeah, it is what it is. I can't really understand how nice this looks with its all black and silver kind of aesthetic. And those capacitors look really good with that silver and gold accent. Next up, it's fan installation. This is something I'm genuinely excited about. I haven't used Noctos fan before and they are set to be whole. They are industry standard in terms of cooling, at least air cooling for PC building enthusiasts. Enthusiasts, whatever how you pronounce it. And I'm going to first be installing this anti-vibration uh, pads and then going to be using those anti-vibration uh, mounts to install it to the case to prevent uh, vibrations and it will make for a very quiet system. This should be easy, but it just takes time. Just press these black mounts. Yeah, I even bought mounts for both sides of the fan, even though I can't see it. Just for completeness sake, why not? This is second hand. I got it for real cheap. It's like 50 cents a piece around there. Here we go. This is a very therapeutic process. <laughs> Yeah, I'm finally done with the anti-vibration pad installation. Next, we install this anti-vibration mounts. I gotta follow Noctos manual for this. I've seen some other videos where they install it the wrong way, so I'm gonna do it right the first time around. So we're supposed to install this uh, fan blade down, put it through this mounting holes, pull it through. Hold it just like that. It's tighter than I expected. It's okay, just regret through the whole way. Alright, it's cut of resistance, but it'll go through the end. Damn. It got me a little worried. Alright. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> and so I fucked up guys. I totally installed this wrong. Basically the side of the case that I want to pull this guy through. Needs to be the short side. So in this case, these are gonna be intake fans. So the short side should be on this side. So I'm gonna remove all of this and switch it around. That's a bummer. God fucking damn it. Now we install the fan to the case. Let's put it right here. It's supposed to pull this nipples through. Okay. I think we're good there. Put it through. Hey. That's easy. That's real easy installation. And they look real nice at that. I'm gonna move this up a little bit. This one as well, here. Yeah. They're a bit slidey though. But uh, yeah, who cares? As long as they work fine. And now we're gonna do the back side one. Same deal. Right over here. Now we pull this through. Next, it's definitely gonna be front panel installation and those pesky small cables. Just cables right in. Ah, this way it belong. And this is snap in. Just gonna add some force and we're good to go there. Just like that. Boom! Front panel cables. Good thing I remember where they are. First order of business. PS2 stroke comes up. First time I use cases with this kind of PS2 strokes. So I've already connected up all the model cables that I need to the PSU. First, what I like to do is I'm going to wire up all those cable extensions so that I can bundle up these cables at the power supply basement. That makes for easier cable management later on. Ok, 
Okay, first up. Done a four pin model power. There we go. Just like that. Ugh. Satisfying click. Right here. This first one. Here we go. PCIe cable extension number two. We can supply two times eight pin CPU power to our motherboard. So we're gonna use two of these. Just in case we're gonna we wanna do some insane overclocks. We have that you know power head away, so to speak, to go for it. Right, and the last one. Yeah, there we go. Now we are free to bundle this guy up in the power supply basement. So I'm just gonna mesh it in with some finesse, hopefully. Then bundling them up in one bundle like that will be probably good enough. Oh, God damn it. Yeah. Yes. Now we attach our power supply stroke to our PSU. Just like that. I like to put them on loosely and then tighten them when I have all the screws fitted in the screw holes. That way I have room to wiggle right now. So I'll go brute and get them in. Now we slide all the cables through. Get out of the way. Hey baby, get out of the way. So I'm making sure our fan strokes or rather our intakes at the bottom. Come on baby, go through. It's really weird to be mashing this shit. But should we find her? Oh. Alright, we got this auto in. We just gotta hand tighten this. Thumb screws are meant to be hand tightened, not screwed down by screwdrivers. Now we're gonna install the CPU. And clips the retention bracket. We're gonna install this guy, the Ryzen 7 5800X. Here we go. Put it in the right orientation. Clips it in. Give it a wiggle. Yeah, it's in all right. 32 gigabytes. Running at 3600 megahertz. CL18. This gray T Create RAM by Team Group, which works fine in this team. Boom. So it's fine. Click. Installing them in the A2 and B2 configuration as per usual. Now we put on a piece size of this guy, the Arctic MX4 thermal paste. Pretty affordable thermal grease as that. Yeah. Just that amount should be sufficient. I'm gonna be using this stock side fence. There are only 1.2k RPM fans, but should work plenty fine this build. In the previous ITX with a modest underclock, it works wonders. So I'll still be continuing using them. Otherwise, I'll probably stitch them out for Noctar Redux and probably go triple fan configuration for excellent airflow there. Yeah, let's get them hooked on. Hey, yeah, we got it. The color is slightly off compared to Noctos. Oh, but if the lighting is not so ideal, it should be just fine. Next up, we're gonna install the particular GPU bracket. So make sure the PCI Express lock lever is open. Oh, I'm gonna jam this in. All right. Should that snap? Awesome. And now, holy moly, get our fat boy in. 
a bit of a squeeze, but it should work. It's looking real fine right now already. So you guys have a preview of how it's going to look. Woo! Perfect. I wish this Redux were a tad like, more metallic, but overall, the black and grey aesthetic, I nailed it right there. In the miracle of time, we got it done. So I decided to install Windows 11, seeing as I haven't used it before. It's a good opportunity to give it a go. As soon as I install it, everything works perfectly fine. I realized that with this system, if I'm trying to play a certain video or YouTube or just general surfing the web, the system will just restart out of nowhere without any warning. And it'll just put to BIOS, go to Windows, and try to do the same thing, it will rinse and repeat. Uh, I tried a lot of solutions, or so try to check whether there's any general conflicts, or uh, even disable the XMP profile on the RAM, because sometimes uh, certain XMP speeds are a bit high and your RAM doesn't run that stable and it causes system instability. I also tried to reduce, or rather manually cap the virtual memory within 32 gigabytes, such that I don't overuse what I have and nothing works. Finally, this is what that worked. After going through multiple solutions, I was about ready to give up. I thought maybe the PCIe vertical bracket, or rather the PCIe Gen 2 has a cable has a problem. I wanted to swap that out. And my last resort, before short of going back to Windows 10, is to, you know, remove that uh, Gen 3 riser cable and connect the GPU directly to the motherboard. When I figure out that uh, that's the setting in the BIOS, it turns out what I had to do was really simple. First, I go into the BIOS, go to the settings, head to advanced settings, head to PCIe subsystem settings, and for the slot that they're using, in my case, I'm using the PCIe E1 Gen switch, and everything works like a charm. It's pretty insane what this setting can do. I believe it's something of a Gen 4 GPU connected to a Gen 3 riser cable, connected to a Gen 4, like, a PCIe slot that's wonking it out. So with it fixed to Gen 3, everything works absolutely fine. Perfect. If you're still sticking around and liking that Asian Tech Guy content, feel free to give a video a like and hit the subscribe button down below. Just jam on it real hard because 95% of the guys aren't subscribed. I would greatly appreciate it if you do. So I put a Gigabyte Aorus NVMe 1TB Gen 4 drive through its paces. I went ahead and tested it on Crystal this month. It pretty much achieved within the ballpark of its advertised speeds. I got about 5000 megabytes per second reads and about 4200 megabytes per second write. So that's pretty good in my books. It's about time to put a 5800X in the RTX 3080 hotbox through its paces and we see what it can get. First off, we try to maximize the GPU and CPU usage by running Inogen Heaven at 3440 by 1440p default high settings and Cinebench R33 at the same time. Our GPU was drawing about 324 watts and was getting about 75 degrees Celsius for max temperatures. And as for CPU, we are drawing about 137 watts. And we're hitting a maximum of 90 degrees Celsius, which is a bit too high for my liking. With a bit of undervolting in the BIOS, and also Palette Tunnel Buster, because this guy requires the Tunnel Master software to be on in order to disable the LEDs, because I'm going for a fully blackout build. I'm also going to be disabling the red LED, which is the DR debug, so that it's a fully blackout kind of aesthetic. So this is what I managed to do for the CPU. I unvoted it to 1.25 volts. And the GPU, I did a minus 100 megahertz to the core clock and plus 100 megahertz to the memory clock. With that, take a look at our improved temps. For the GPU, with the same kind of parameters, we managed to get a max temp of 71 degrees Celsius, drawing 277 watts. And the CPU is drawing 130.6 watts and running at a max temps of 84.3. I would say that's decent kind of results there, or rather improvement in temps. Take note, however, for games, you're not going to like max up both at the same time. Typically, you'll max out your GPU, and the CPU is running probably about 50 or 60%. That's typically the case for most games. And for idle temps, 
of GPU seen an improvement from 41.8 degrees Celsius to 38.7, and the CPU seen an improvement from 50.1 to 40.6 degrees Celsius. And as for our benchmark scoring, we retain about 96.5% performance on Nijin Heaven. On Cinebench, we retain about 90% of our stock performance with, I would say, to me, a decent gain in temps. Is it worth it? From what the numbers I see, I think yes, for a decent improvement in temperatures, which affects the longevity of components, you'll get just a little bit of a performance decrease, which is really worth it in my books. I mean, if you really want to go balls to the walls, you don't care about power draw, yeah, you can do it. But something that I like to do personally, besides having a temperature reduction, in terms of noise levels, they also drastically reduce that, which makes for overall quieter system. This is definitely not the optimal, you know, unavoid settings that I've done for this guy. But I believe you've spent some time tweaking the settings. I believe if I believe you spend some time on the settings, could be able to probably well, tweak it further and get a better temperature performance. Now we set off to the gaming benchmarks. The first game I'm checking out, it just released in the mid of August. It's no other than Rumbleverse. When I first started this game, it was kind of weird because my FPS was locked at about 120. So doing some digging, I realized that you have to edit a config file. I managed to get an average FPS of 189 for 1% lows of 89 FPS. First impressions? If you don't know, this game has the battle royal kind of style going on. But it has a fighting game kind of gameplay where it uses a lot of melee hand-to-hand -hand combat. And of course, you can show some stuff and things like that. You can even block, dodge, sprint, the usual long jump. You can use a combination of weak and strong attacks. Some of them are unblockable, but you leave yourself vulnerable to attacks if you miss. You can even read manuals and add them to one out of two of the hotkey skills. Things like your Dragon Punch, Hadouken, you can even do things like air combos. It's really insane. Although I, I can't figure out how to do it yet. But the plus playing this game, it's probably something I'm going to be playing the next few weeks. Kill time. If I have time, I strongly recommend you guys to check out this game. As for other popular titles, see the results on the screen. Typical of the RTX 3080 and 5800X. Performance is as expected, so I should be all set for gaming. Yeah! With that, I think we come to the end of the video. Hopefully, I won't be tempted by the AMD 7000 series CPU range coming up. And of course, the RTX 4000 series. Otherwise, I'm going to burn a hole in my wallet again. Luckily, I didn't spend too much on this build. I hope you guys enjoyed this build. If you want to follow something similar, as I mentioned, everything in the description box down below. Until the next time, this is Clarence from Mission Tech Guy. Check it out.